the Vicar Engine graphics API was updated significantly lately with the removal of DX11. The DX12 rendering mode is now default on Windows and the Vulkan rendering mode is now used by Linux. It will take some more time to completely stabilize these new changes, but uh, they already provide significant benefits, which I will discuss now. The bindless descriptors feature is now enabled by default, and uh, this means that uh, now we rely less on binding resources such as textures and buffers, cost and buffers for every true call. Instead, we provide the GPU scene data in uh, user-defined structures that contain indices to textures, buffers or any kind of resources that, that uh, the GPU might need. And this means that we only need to update a bunch of buffers up front uh, at the beginning of the frame, which contains these indices, which is a relatively lightweight CPU operation. And uh, from that time, for the whole duration of the frame, the GPU will be able to index any resource from the scene, from any shader. This is very useful for a bunch of already implemented existing techniques, such as well, ray tracing is the most importantly needs this feature, but also all of the object rendering shaders are, are using these new techniques now. In the shader interop uh, underscore renderer header file, uh, if you open it uh, from the shaders project interop, uh, here. This header file is included in both shaders and the C++ uh, files and it describes some common uh, GPU scene uh, structures such as the shader scene and every such uh, struct uh, starts with the shader and then shader scene, shader material, shader mesh, mesh instance and such. These uh, usually contain these, these integers, simply integers. These are referring to GPU resources. So the instance buffer, for example, refers to a GPU buffer that contains instances. The mesh buffer refers to a buffer that contains mesh descriptors. And mesh descriptors are also these, these custom data structures. And also the instances, the materials are all these custom data, data structures that are also described in this file. For example, if you scroll down, the shader material is also such such a structure. Uh, all of the scenes materials are now stored uh, in, a, in a contiguous array, a buffer, a GPU buffer that can be referenced by only this, uh, this material buffer index. And then any material within that buffer can be referenced by an index such as the material index from, for example, a, a mesh or a, a subset or something. And then also the, the top-level acceleration structure. It's not, it's not a pointing to a user-defined structure, but structure of buffers, but uh, it's a it's a hardware ray tracing acceleration structures uh, pointer. The end map array is pointing to an array of texture cubes, uh, for example, and anything that the GPU might need can be can be referenced uh, like this from now on. As as I said. These are updated from the scene, and uh, the way it's done is by uh, if you go to the to the if you go to the scenes uh, header file here. This is the this is containing every kind of component and uh, thing that uh, that can be in the scene, and this uh, has a scene structure. You can search for it by just the scene. And first occurrence seems to be here. Okay, so the scene contains a bunch of names, layers, meshes, transforms, materials, everything uh, is going to contain in these component managers, which which are which are these linear arrays of materials, objects and stuff. And most of these will be or are already accessible from the GPU by uploading these arrays to the GPU. In uh, well not the whole representation of uh, objects and materials, but only the things that the GPU will need. So, for example, the materials component corresponding GPU data structure is the shader material. And the material array will be the shader material array in the, on the GPU side. And the way that this is done is uh, if you check 
check out uh, this. Um, so the material array is contained in a material upload buffer, which is written by the CPU. And uh, the material buffer may be a GPU only material buffer resource, which would not be necessarily needed, but uh, the upload buffers GPU access is quite slow, so we upload it to a default GPU resource. Well, I'll talk about this a bit, uh, a bit later. So the next important uh, feature is the persistent mapping of GPU buffers. Uh, in the DX11, uh, when you needed to write or read a buffer, you always had to map, unmap it. So map it before writing from the CPU and then unmap it for the GPU to be able to use it. Now this is not needed. The GPU buffer's uh, usage can be now uh, usage upload or usage readback. These are the new usage flags and the dynamic usage was removed. Default usage is still the same, which is a GPU only access uh, for reading and writing from the GPU. The usage upload, okay, I will also show this here in the, in the graphics uh, header. If you go to the GPU buffer desk, uh, here you see that the usage by default is the default usage such as GPU only access type but uh, the other usages is now the default CPU no access GPU access of read write the usage upload is for CPU writes and the GPU reads but the GPU reads will be inefficient and uh, well, the CPU can also read it but it will be highly inefficient and uncached the usage read back is for specifically for uh, writing from the GPU and reading back data from the CPU. And there was also the dynamic usage in DX11, which was uh, a very DX11 specific, that's no longer supported. You could say that the current state is uh, very much simplified and more so with the addition of the persistent mapping feature. So if you create buffers with usage upload or usage readback, these buffers will be mapped uh, from the creation and uh, they will be mapped for their whole lifetime. So they will never have to be, have to be unmapped, but uh, you will need to take special care uh, to, the, to the usual fact that uh, whatever you write from the CPU, ensure that the GPU is not trying to read from that. The, you are not overwriting data that the GPU is still currently using. You will have to pay attention for that. But uh, you can see a fine example for that in the, in the WI scene, where these uh, upload buffers are, uh, once they are created, they are directly written from the CPU while updating the scene. So these upload buffers are always uh, created in, in, a, in a doubled buffered fashion. So if you if you see this tooltip, uh, there are two material upload buffers, uh, which is two because the buffer count is set up to be two now, which you can access by the graphics device buffer count, which is a, allows you to statically allocate uh, the buffer count of two array. And the way it is used is that uh, whenever the CPU is writing the, this material buffer zero, then the GPU is using material buffer one, for example. And uh, since the persistent mapping is in effect, uh, you will never have to care about uh, mapping and unmapping buffers. And for that reason, the map unmap uh, function from the graphics device was also removed. It's, it's, it will be no longer needed. It's handled internally by the, by the graphics device implementations. You could use these material upload buffers and all, all like the mesh upload buffers directly from the GPU, but uh, it's not recommended, as the performance of the GPU will be slow. The, using the upload buffers is, is recommended for, for small data that is uh, accessed in only one or two draw calls. And uh, it's, a, it's a better fit for constant buffers. As I said, the dynamic usage was removed, so like in DX11 you can't do the dynamic updates of constant buffers like you used to. Instead, I now provide uh, a better, a better utility function for, for updating and binding dynamic constant buffers. If you check out the graphics device uh, header, 
you find uh, several like uh, helper functions on the bottom. And the bind dynamic cost and buffer is one of them. It's a templated function, it can accept uh, uh, your own data type, for example for a constant buffer structure type. It will allocate the GPU memory for it uh, dynamically, which is, is a non-costly operation. It's a, it's a linear allocated GPU memory. It will, it will copy your data into it and bind to the constant buffer. And it's possible because of the new feature that uh, allows you to bind constant buffers with a, with a user-defined offset. This was not possible uh, really easily with the DX11, but uh, now it's actually uh, simplifies the implementation of it significantly and it will be it will be more optimal to, to it, do it this way. So when you allocate the GPU memory you get back a buffer and an offset you can just uh, write to the that buffer's mapped data and bind the constant buffer with, with that offset you allocated. Also uh, I forgot to mention that when you create the upload or readback buffers. I said that they are persistently mapped. The, the mapped data pointer can be accessed from the from the GPU resources mapped data pointer. Uh, you can see an example for this in the scene CPP. Here in the scene update function where I, I created the for example the mesh array, the upload buffer for the mesh array. Uh, the mapped data, the mesh array mapped, is now we refer to a shader mesh pointer. It, it will be simply accessed with the mapped data, and the mapped data is part of the the GPU resource. After you created the GPU buffer or texture, as they are a child of the GPU resource structure, they will have the mapped data filled with the pointer that you can use for the CPU. In the case of textures, you also have to pay attention to the map droppage, which indicates uh, how long the, the width of the texture is in bytes. So you can efficiently write uh, linear texture data into it or, or read back linear texture data from the GPU. When uh, you use readback buffers uh, with a texture or, or readback uh, usage with a texture, when you download textures on, texture from the GPU, you will have that auto conversion of the GPU texture format into into linear data, uh, linear data format. So you will have to use this map through page to access uh, the texture uh, row by row. Uh, if you are interested, you can see an example for that in the, the WI helper. Um, the, the helper class is found here in the helpers. Let's open it and. Uh, find the screenshot function screenshot. here uh, as you can see uh, this is used to take a screenshot of the of the back buffer and uh, save it to the file and the way this is done is when you go through it uh, it saves the texture to the memory and that involves reading back data from the GPU so it creates a usage readback, uh, like a staging texture creates it, and then just a copy resource to the staging staging texture from the from the GPU texture, and then using the map data and the map through which to read back data from it. It's quite quite an advanced use case. Uh, you might not be interested in this, but if you are, then here is the example how to do that. Okay, that's enough from for for the for the persistent mapping. I think this uh, this will significantly simplify all your all your uh, CPU to GPU data flowing operations. Now the next update is uh, the improvement of the update buffer function, which is now not a custom DX12 or Vulkan implementation, but instead it's it's just a helper function provided in, in the graphics device header. It's kind of a backwards compat compatibility option, which is now effic more efficiently implemented without using barriers in, in the middle of it. So that that just means that when you batch more update buffers or copy commands back-to-back, -back, then 
they don't they won't always barrier and wait for the previous copy to finish. You can just uh, do a bunch of update buffers and then at the end of all, all of them just do one barrier. That will indicate a synchronization point between the buffer updates and the, the, the shaders after that that rely on the buffer data as being updated. And the example you can find is in the is in the WI render CPP update render data function. So this is the first function that uh, kind of uh, runs on the GPU. This updates uh, every uh, scene data. So it uploads all the material, the mesh arrays, and the uh, global per frame constant buffer. So it uses the update buffers and the copy buffers uh, functionalities uh, back to back without doing any barrier commands. And uh, instead, uh, I provided a simple helper utility, which is the barrier stack. You can use it in the WI renderer to just uh, add more barriers, and then the barriers are not actually like done on the GPU. But uh, if you done all the all the buffer copy or update buffer operations, then or anything uh, which which will need barriers, then at the end you will just. Uh, flush the barriers with this barrier stack flush and then what this does is that the GPU will see a bunch of copy operations, update buffer operations and then at the end there will be a single barrier and uh, that will batch the copies, copies sufficiently. This also means that what uh, you previously used, where you previously used the update buffers uh, that will unfortunately need to you will need to take care of the fact now that these uh, must be synchronized with the barriers uh, explicitly. And also these update buffers are can now not be used inside inside the render passes, which was also the case previously, but previously you had you all also had the dynamic buffer updates, which are now with the, with the usage dynamic, uh, I mean, which are now not available, so they will also we have to be just done outside of uh, render passes. This this is just because uh, in the Excel and Vulkan it doesn't allow you to to do any any copy operations inside the render passes. So we don't allow it either. Okay, so I, I talked about the dynamic constant buffer updating, which uh, which I described here. You can use this instead of the usage dynamic buffer updates. But uh, there is also a more efficient case for this because this uh, dynamic constant buffer will use this uh, allocate GPU, which allocates uh, the GPU buffer memory for you, which uh, which is in the upload usage. It's not uh, efficiently accessed by the by the GPU actually. It's it's fine if you use it for constant buffers for a one row call or something. Uh, you, you wouldn't want to use it for for uh, data that's accessed repeatedly throughout the whole frame. But for such small data you can be even more efficient by using a push constants instead of the instead of constant buffers. The push constants are allow you to upload an even smaller amount of data, which is maximum of 128 bytes. So you can fit two 4x4 matrices into, into the push constants. Which uh, allows you to to efficiently upload a small amount of uh, per row data, for example, such as descriptor indices or like a matrix or something or color, but not any big data. And the benefit of this is that uh, the push constants uh, function that uh, you can find here, which was also already available for the X12 and Vulkan, this doesn't use any GPU allocation. Instead, it uh, it just uh, writes. Uh, Writes your data into the command buffers, and the the shaders actually access it in a more efficient way than than a dynamic constant buffer that that was allocated from the upload heap. I recommend to use uh, push constants uh, uh, a lot uh, a lot in the engine if if you want, but uh, there is also a limit of that uh, 128 bytes, and also. One shader can only use one block of push constant, um, so something to keep in mind. 
For example, if you want an example for this, just check out any post-process shader, which were heavily refactored to use these uh, push constants to, to access the post-process parameters. Let's check out uh, the compute shader. The first one is the balloon combine CS. This is a pretty, pretty simple post-process shader. It declares the push constant block like this. You have to use this for declaring it for both uh, the PX7 Vulkan uh, shader compiler uh, in a unif unified way. First parameter is simply the, the name of that push constant block. If you search for it uh, by the name, you can access any parameter from it. And the second is the, is the structure's name. And uh, that you can find in the shader interrupt post process header file. So I don't know why, but uh, if, I, if I try to open this from Visual Studio, it doesn't let me for some weird reason. So I have to just uh, manually go to, to this file. So the shaders project, uh, the interrupt folder, post process header. So this post process structure is uh, used for most of the post process shaders to, to access those, uh, those push cost and uh, data. Which, which are the post-process parameters such as resolution, resolution reciprocal, and, uh, and uh, some common post-process parameters. And then check out any post-process function in the WR render CVP to see how to bind the push constant block, which is pretty simple. For example, okay, I, WR render CVP, I close everything, so in the bottom, there are these post-process uh, shaders, so I don't know, I open this uh, post-process HBAO and here is the push constant block is declared here, post-process. This structure is available in the CPP side because the, the shader interrupt post-process header is also included here. So I just fill out every parameter of the post-process uh, block and then call the push constants with, with its pointer and size. It's essentially bound immediately for the for the following dispatch commands. The next important addition is the that async compute is default now, since uh, it was only not used in DX11, but in DX12 and Balkan it was already used. Several post processes were already implemented for async compute, such as the volumetric cloud updates, uh, screen space shadows, ray trace shadows, screen space reflection, and some, some more. These were already using async computer and were running asynchronously with the shadow map generation, the, the environment probe uh, rendering, and the planar reflections. So those were running uh, on the graphics pipeline and the post-processes were running on the async compute pipeline. And uh, also the, the acceleration structure updates for the ray tracing were, were running asynchronously with the, with the depth prepass uh, generation on the graphics pipeline. It's, uh, it's recommended to use uh, the async compute whenever the graphics pipeline is doing a not compute heavy operation, such as uh, depth rendering Depth only rendering is the best fit, but like Depth Prepass doesn't use complicated pixel shaders as well, so that could be good too. And uh, now new async uh, compute, uh, like new graphics effects were brought into async compute uh, stage, such as updating the emitted particle systems and uh, updating the ocean waves are now done asynchronously to the to the depth prepass generation. Okay, let's take a look at what the async compute pipelines might look like. So this is a performance optimization on the GPU. And for that, uh, since I have an NVIDIA, I, I use the NSight graphics profiler. I set up the Wicked Engine executable, the correct working directory, which is important. And uh, okay, the DX12 argument, which Actually, I don't have to do it because uh, it's already default on Windows. And the, the, the GPU trace, 
I launch this and uh, it will fire up the application. Okay, seems like I have already have it running, so just close it. And uh, I launch it again. It fires up the application and I will load the sponsor model. And uh, I just capture this frame with the F11 button. It takes a bit of time. Go back to end site and then open open it. Okay, just adjust the screen layout a bit like this. So this open up the markers a bit so that we can see better. As you can see, there are two rows of markers. The first row indicates all the all the things running on the graphics pipeline, and the bottom row of markers is the compute pipeline. Uh, it's a bit. Uh, it looks a bit strange because I am also running the screen capture right now, so it uh, it won't look as as uh, severe and underutilized. But right now it's is for some reason. Anyway, so here you can see that by the time the OPEX-Z prepass is running on the graphics pipeline, uh, some particle updating is also running on the compute pipeline. There are some gaps caused, I think, by the screen capture application and uh, here when the sh shadow map rendering is running and the end probe refresh the compute pipeline is also running the visibility resolve shader the updating entity callings and as you can see the second part of the frame is is not very as asynchronized so it mostly uses the graphics pipeline for this heavy opaque scene rendering and uh, then also some post-process compute shaders which uh, which cannot be made really asynchronous because they they depend on, on the opaque scene very much. These post-processes include the depth of field and motion blur and, and things like that, and the bloom and then also the, the GUI rendering which also kind of uh, depends on these post processes a bit to be able to use that 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 blurred background for the for the GUI. But okay, anyway. So this is uh, the compute pipelines uh, that the async compute pipelines current state. Since it's default now, it will receive more attention and more updates uh, possibly in the future. Okay, the last thing I want to mention is the addition of the visibility buffer rendering. Now the Z prepass doesn't render a velocity buffer and the opaque pass doesn't render a normal ZG buffer, but instead only the opaque Z prepass renders a triangle visibility buffer that uh, just says for every pixel which triangle from which mesh is visible. And from that we can compute a bunch of interesting uh, parameters of the surface. Uh, it can be anything, it can be so the surface's velocity. The, the normals, with, with normal mapping or without normal mapping and anything. And the, the good thing is that each post-process now can decide uh, what, what it needs and it can just sample the surface for, for the required parameters. So we don't write now a bunch of G-buffers for, for roughness, normal, velocity and, and such. It uh, still not received its full potential because we still write out the velocity buffer for some obscure reasons. Uh, such as multiple post processes will need it, like temporal A motion blur, and it uh, just was more efficient to, to write it out. Anyway, this will be improved further in the future, possibly. Now we use a regular forward a tiled forward pipeline, which requires two full geometry passes for opaque objects, because uh, one is the Z prepass, which is an an optimization and it allows kink kicking of the post processes following early before the opaque uh, pass runs which is essentially rendering the all the geometry in the camera again but now with more complex shaders that uh, that we render proper lighting and colors but with the vis visibility buffer we will have the opportunity to to optimize it further in a way that uh, 
the second uh, opaque uh, scene pass will not be needed perhaps. At least not a full geometry pipeline pass for it. We could use a full screen pass, a single full screen shader, to be just read from the from the visibility buffer and then just compute the surface parameters and the lighting right there. The, the downside of that is that um, it will be very difficult to support proper proper MIP mapping, multi-sample anti-aliasing and uh, variable rate shading and then also supporting various uh, uh, kind of uh, material models. So that's something I could try in the future but it will be quite quite, quite a big uh, rewrite of the, the pipeline again. And then we made the forward learning pipeline is, is quite convenient because it's uh, it's it's quite easy to, to manage and uh, for simple scenes it uh, really is the best kind of pipeline. The problem is that just it probably doesn't scale up too well for for more complicated uh, geometry. Okay, I don't know how many of you are actually using the graphics uh, API of the Wicked Engine that much. I I, I know a few of the few few people use it such as uh, also, also the Game Guru Max uh, team who are still using the DX11 pipeline and unfortunately for those uh, people that were using the, the old pipelines, the old APIs these uh, changes will, will need a significant rewrite hopefully this video could uh, help some of you with that uh, I'm not sure of course that on the Discord I will still be answering any questions about this or in the video comments as well. So that's it for this week, catch you in the next video.